Welcome to The Debate here on France 24. I'm Charlie James in for Francois Picard today. And we are finally just one day away from Election Day in the United States. And on today's debate, we are focusing in on what you need to know and watch for to understand Election Day as it unfolds. We've got a great panel of guests, including representatives from the Democrats and Republicans here abroad, to discuss what will make or break the election for their candidates. Let me introduce you to them. First up, we have uh, Paul Rehn. You are president of Republicans in France. It's That's a correct. nonprofit group group here for supporters. Mm -hmm. You guys uh, re speak about the uh, Republican perspective here in France. Exactly. Great mm -hmm. to have you. Thank Thanks. you for the invitation. And on the other side here, Donna Ghosh, uh, you are a delegate for Democrats abroad and a get out the vote officer here in France. Yes, that's Thanks correct. for joining us. Thank you for and inviting me. And finally, Olivier Bertin, you are a U.S. historian and an associate professor of U.S. history at the Université de Picardie, Jules Thank, Thank you, you so much me. for being here today. We are going to kick off this discussion. There are so many different things that we could talk about, but we are going to kick off this discussion by talking about the early vote. So tomorrow is election day, but in fact, 75 million Americans have already voted early. That's about a third of all eligible voters. And projections based on this early vote signal that the overall turnout in 2024 is probably going to be slightly lower than in 2020, um, but it should be higher than in 2016 and most other previous election. So we can infer a little bit about the enthusiasm that voters have for the candidates. And in this report, Eliza Herbert takes a closer look at the early vote. Mm. Early voting centres are teeming across the United States, but despite the long queues, the spirit of democracy remains high. We've been here for two and a half hours and the mood is still great. Um, we are almost there. We're in the home stretch. We got in line around 2 p.m. and now it's 6 p.m. Eastern time and we did it. And I'm proud that, you know, we, we added our voice. With the polls neck and neck, Americans appear anxious to make their votes count. Already more than 75 million people have cast early ballots, particularly in crucial battleground states. Records have been broken in Georgia and North Carolina, with some 4 million and 4.5 million votes cast respectively. In Michigan, nearly 3 million people have already voted, and in Arizona, 2.3 million. Wisconsin and Nevada have also returned high numbers. So far, statistics show that women have voted more than men, and there has been a larger portion of rural voters showing up early. But it is still not quite clear which party will benefit. Four years ago, in 2020, a record-breaking 70% of the overall turnout voted early, either by mail or in person. Democrats were urged to vote by mail to avoid the spread of COVID-19, and ultimately the party gained votes in the counties that returned more mail ballots. Scenes of chaos then unfolded after Donald Trump doubled down on unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud and refused to accept the election result. A scenario this expert worries could be repeated. The more uh, voting at a distance or voting early, voting sort of out of, uh, of the regular schedule there is, the more challenges there are going to be. Uh, if everything happens on the same day, it's harder for, for the uh, loser, I think, to complain because everybody's following the same rules on the same day, in this, in, in, depending on which state they're in. Both presidential candidates Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have encouraged early voting this election. Now, Olivia, as mentioned in that report, you know, during COVID, mail-in ballots, early voting became just a huge element of the U.S. election. How has early voting influenced uh, how the candidates campaign? And is there anything that you read into these numbers that we're getting from early voting? So it used to be that early voters used to favor the Democratic Party more heavily. Uh, now that's changed recently, mostly because Trump has largely sort of stopped uh, calling early voters basically a fraud. Uh, and so he's sort of begun to encourage that trend in a way that the Republican Party used not to do. Uh, and so that's sort of um, even the scale a little bit. Uh, and encourage more people in his own party to actually go and vote early. Um, the trend is 
probably going to be that on uh, election day tomorrow, we, we're not actually going to have the full picture. And that's probably also going to uh, fuel conspiracy theories about who is actually the winner and how much can we actually know early on uh, the outcome of the election, probably. Yep. Paul, there has been a concerted effort uh, in Republican states, I'm thinking of Georgia specifically, mm -hmm. to get people to out to vote early mm -hmm. more, for Republicans out to vote early more, to vote by mail. Uh, have you seen this to be working as far as uh, with Republican turnout and enthusiasm? Yeah, I mean, I mean typically, as Olivier said, Republicans want to want a system of voting similar to France. You know, that's good security. People come uh, face to face and in the voting booths and, and, and vote on all on the same day and you get the result on the same day. So we have we've been reluctant to vote uh, early, um, but it is available. It's there. We're going to change our behavior this year. And yeah, signs are positive, too. The, 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 a lot of Republicans voting early uh, and the signs are positive. We're doing very, very well in many of the key states, as you've seen in the uh, in the polls. There's two differences, though. There's ma vote by mail and there's vote early. They are different. Uh, there was massive vote by mail in 2020 primarily on the Democrats, not the Republicans, said to be because it was too dangerous to go to the, the polling booths. Um, and this year, so basically they removed all the limits of conditions that would apply t to allow you to vote by mail. Those conditions have been re-implemented, so there's less voting by mail, just to the people like us who live overseas or out of state that are legitimately need to vote by mail. But in the, in the vote, uh, early voting is... Uh, either but is in place. I mean, you can, there is, of course, you can throw in the vote by mail for early voting, but people go to the booths and vote, mm -hmm. but since early October, okay? And that's where Re Repu Democrats used to do that all the time. Now it's both Democrats and Republicans. Hopefully it'll make the counting and the tabulation and the total a little quicker mm -hmm. and we'll have a result quicker. Yeah, there a have been states fraud. that have learned some lessons yeah. from last time, changed the rules a little bit, so, done a little bit more preparation, have more experience. But has yeah. there been any confusion or like whiplash for Republican voters? Because in 2020, Donald Trump was very openly against uh, early voting, mail-in voting. And... Yeah. Now, very quickly, the tune has changed. Well, we saw what happened in 2020, where we went to sleep uh, and Trump was way ahead. We woke up and, you know, he, uh, Biden had won because of all these mail-in votes that arrived in, you know, and people were forced to count them throughout the night. So, uh, you know, basically we're like, OK, let's limit that. Voting, er, early voting is available. Let's not wait to the last day where it could be chaos again. Let's get out and vote early. So both Democrats and Republicans are voting early, which is good. We, we all love voting. Voting is non is non political. Everyone should be going out and voting, no matter who you support. But Donna, a part of your work with Democrats abroad is getting American college students who are studying abroad to vote. I mean, Americans abroad usually have very low turnout rates. But what is the process like with get encouraging college students and what kind of enthusiasm are you seeing this year? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, first of all, one of the big things is that we haven't really recognized exactly how many Americans actually live abroad anymore. I think we're still a little bit lodged in the past in terms of how we understand that. And so over the decades, we've really seen just an enormous number of increase of Americans that live abroad and also just university students that live abroad, for example, that go abroad for their exchange year. And these students just absolutely aren't tapped and their voices just aren't heard whatsoever when it comes to election years, mainly because there's just a lot of confusion currently about how you can vote abroad. And so a lot of the work that Democrats Abroad does is we go out to these university students. We go out to, obviously, as many Americans living abroad as we humanly can and reach out to them and tell them to vote abroad. But one of the big pushes that we've been making, especially this year, is to university students to get them just really just understand the process of voting. Um, and especially if this is your first election, how to vote abroad, how to vote at all, and really just contact them individually and like reach out to them like that. I do have to say they do not make it easy to vote 
abroad at all. When I lived in New York, I would go with my French husband to the consulate, and he would vote in French elections, and it looked exactly like it does here, but we don't have the option of going and voting at the embassy, for example. Oh, right. No. It's like 50 yeah. different systems. That is something we are working on simplifying. We are trying to make sure that it is actually easy for people to just vote. That is one very yeah. big part of the Democrats abroad effort yeah, and also just the Democratic Party's effort in general, I would say. The only real important thing to know is you have to register first. Mm -hmm. With uh, You can't just vote. You have to register early and then get your vote, um, your voting bulletin, your ballot sent to you. Um, so you... I'm not yeah. entirely sure if that's maybe the It's like 50 different systems. Well, it's, <laughs> it's like 50 different, different systems. <laughs> um, there's faxes, there's emails, there's post offices. Oh, yeah, when I say sent, I mean email. I mean, they, you can do it all by email now. Not really. No, I can't in New York. Not well, in New York. Okay. But it, I want to take a it, look. Since we're in debate and people are debating me, it depends on the state. Every state yes. has different requirements. Yes. Okay. yes, the U.S. election is actually 50 different small elections. Yes. But Absolutely. So to, today, Monday, is really the last day of campaigning. Not much happens on Tuesday besides people actually going to the polls and voting for the candidates. Not much happens. And I want to just look at how Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are closing out their final day of campaigning. Both are spending most of Monday in Pennsylvania. Now, that is a state that polls indicate is super close, could go for either candidate, and it has the most delegates of any swing state. So it's very important for both candidates to win. Harris will hold her final rally in Philadelphia at the art museum there on the famous Rocky Steps. It was a location made famous in the movie Rocky. Trump is going to close out his campaign in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's a bit of a tradition for him now. He also held his final rallies there in 2016 and 2020. But we have a, a clip of Trump speaking at his first rally today in North Carolina. Have a listen. With your vote tomorrow, I will end inflation. I will stop the invasion of criminals coming into our country. Which I happen to think is the absolute worst thing that has ever happened to our country. I've never seen it. They're putting in murderers, releasing all of their prisoners from jails all over the world, not South America, all over the world, into our country. Olivier, it's the home stretch for these candidates. Are you able to kind of summarize for us what is the main message, the final pitch that they have been trying to break through with voters in these last days? So it seems that for um, Harris, her message has been to uh, tie closer to the center, uh, to prove to Republicans who may uh, no longer be convinced and then that Trump is their the right candidate that perhaps they might switch uh, to over to her side. Uh, for instance, we've seen that with the fact that she brought on uh, Liz Cheney at some point during her campaign to sort of make the national security argument part of her campaign, uh, to try to appeal to never Trumpers uh, among the Republican Party. On um, Trump's side, I think his closing argument really has been hard to distinguish because it's at last week and the week before that, he's been a little bit unhinged. Uh, you know, he's made comments about uh, the size of the genitals of a male golfer, for instance. He's also uh, made comments about how, for instance, um, some journalists should be shot or how Liz Cheney herself should be uh, perhaps put uh, in front of... Um, this is all misinformation. <laughs> this is, you said we could speak, Yes, right? yes, please yeah. do. Well, I was, I was just going to say, Paul, I doubt that you would no. use the word unhinged, but he well, has been he, focusing he more on personal grievances as opposed I'll to like, maybe the economic I don't message interrupt, that his campaign but, would prefer. But it is misinformation. It's just hysteria saying that Trump wanted Liz Cheney to be shot. So you know. did he not say that then? You're taking things out of context. His point was that it's incredible that Harris is supporting Cheney, and Cheney is a, a major surrogate for Kamala Harris. This is the family that the Democrats, I'm old enough to remember, that the Democrats said much far worse things about the Cheneys than Donald Trump ever did. And he was, because 
they were the, they were the number one enemy of the Democrat Party because of the Iraq War and the the financing and getting rich of uh, for the uh, the, the uh, Cheney family. And Trump was just saying, before you keep sending soldiers into war, maybe you should experience the horrors of war first, because that's always been the complaint of the Democrats against the neocon part of the Republicans, the Bush, the Cheneys, the Rumsfields, and now to see Harris embracing Cheneys really tells you a lot about how much the, the Democratic Party has changed. I mean, I think there's a lot of Democrats who would agree that they didn't think there would be a day where the Cheneys would be would be standing behind a Democratic candidate. And on the but other side, you have a Kennedy endorsing, you have ex-Democrats endorsing Trump. You have Bobby Kennedy, who was just ex, you know, basically excoriated, driven out of the Democrat Party. He was trying to run for president of the Democrat Party, had to run as independent. But he's a great ex-Democrat who's in, interested in health. And there's going to be a lot of independents and things who are following um, Kennedy who are now going to uh, vote for Trump. You have, you have um, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, ex-Democrat uh, congressman of Hawaii, ex-military surrogate for Trump. And, of course, we know Elon Musk. But I so I don't think that I think the scale of the ex Democrats that we're looking at versus the scale of the Republicans. I think you have multiple people from Trump's cabinet go on record giving numerous interviews, being like, "I don't think this man is competent to be president again." I would say that if you look at the comparative scale between, say, Tulsi Gabbard and Bobby Kennedy, I think that that's very different. Well, the, the the point is, you know, you can count the different surrogates, but uh, how I mean, many Democrats are ever, really ever supporting Donald? Of course, there's Republicans who hate Trump. You know, most of the people who vote for Trump are voting for Trump's policies. They're voting for Donald Trump. There's a large majority of, of Democrats, you may not realize it, but who are not voting for Kamala Harris. They're voting to stop Trump. That's a huge difference between the two parties. And, and when you look at the people, like the, you know, it's estimate that, that we're going to have the highest number percentage of Latinos and black Americans voting for Donald Trump this year. That's actually not. If you look at NBC polling, they say that right now Trump is pulling at around 9% with black voters, and that's compared to 12% back in 2020. Well, we're going we're gonna to get into the I've seen 20% and 40% for Latinos. We're going to get specifically into these critical blocks of voters that each side needs. I think, though, Paul, just to cap that, the bigger the bigger issue that people have is not necessarily the points that Trump is making. It's more how he's making it. And I think that he's focusing more on personal kind of grievances that he has, as opposed to, I'm sure his campaign would prefer he was talking about the economy more, which is his strongest issue. Well, Do you think that that's campaign. a bad strategy? Should he be focusing more on these top voter issues and less on saying controversial things about Liz Cheney? Well, it wasn't that controversial. It was a very important point to remind people who the Cheneys are. You know, they're warmongers, and now the Democrat Party are embracing them. But I think that this is also misinformation, that he's the only one sending out insults. There's the difference between both candidates. Well, all politicians will insult each other. That's part of politics. Um, but Donald Trump, the difference between Donald Trump and the Democrat Party is uh, he insults the political leaders of the Democrat Party, Biden, Harris, Waltz, Pelosi, the others, the leaders of Congress. Biden has been insulting half of Americans for the past four years. You know, that's a major difference. That's why there's a major polarization in the United States today, greater than previous years. Uh, you call, you know, we went for, everybody knows we went from Clinton's to calling everybody deplorables on the, on the right to Nazi, to Nazi and fascist. It's, it's quite terrible. And then Joe, Bi Joe Biden's recent uh, uh, statement calling Trump followers garbage. Trump doesn't do that. And, and so he does insult his adversaries, but not the people. It's a big difference. So can I jump in here real quick? Yep. I just feel like when we're talking about the people that Trump is attacking versus the people that Democrats are supposedly attacking, first of all, when he talks about how Biden is supposedly has been insulting half of the American people for the past four years. He's really just referring to a verbal gaffe that Biden made a couple of days ago in which he referred to the racist rhetoric and violent rhetoric of the Trump campaign that has been being perpetuated. He referred to that as garbage. 
language. And I would also say, and even if you disagree with that and say it wasn't a verbal gaffe, that's not Kamala Harris. I think what you really have to look at is the difference between what Kamala Harris has been saying versus what Donald Trump has been saying. And even if you want to contextualize things about Liz Cheney and make everything sound a lot different and maybe put in some different context, behind what Trump was saying. At the end of the day, he was advocating for Liz Cheney to be shot, right? I think that's no, a major difference. He was difference. not. Anyway, the point is that um, uh, Donald Trump um, has, um, ah, I forgot my train of thought for a second. But, oh yeah, I want to say, excuse me, I want to say that uh, you, I'm not talking about the last month or two months. I'm talking about the last four years. You know, I'm talking about the past vice, eight. You know, Kamala Harris has been the vice president for four years. Okay, She's always prided and said herself and said she's the last person in the room with Joe Biden before any major decisions. There was major disasters the whole four years. There was slander of, of the right. It was a Biden-Harris strategy to so do this. She cannot divorce herself from that. That's and so... Okay. Well, sorry, I just, I, just, I just want to make sure we get to speaking about some of how, how this rhetoric and how these issues um, impact specific voting blocks. I want to look at some specific voters that Harris and Trump's campaigns are really counting on to deliver the White House to them. On Harris's side, she's really been targeting Republicans, so-called Nikki Haley Republicans, um, who she is hoping uh, will sway to her side. Trump, in the, on his side, is really trying to attract more young men, uh, as well as black and Latino voters, uh, particularly male black and Latino voters. And we uh, can go now to the normal host of the debate, Francois Picard. He is in uh, the U.S. He is reporting from uh, Washington, D.C. He's joining us right now, actually, though, from nearby Maryland. Francois, you uh, have been speaking with Trump supporters today. Uh, tell us more about what you've been hearing from them. Well, I'm actually uh, in uh, Damascus, Maryland, which is uh, on the cusp between uh, the uh, uh, commuters who are going into the U.S. Capitol and uh, farmland. As you, uh, this is we're in a congressional district that uh, runs from the edge of Washington, D.C., all the way to the border with West Virginia. And uh, it's a divided place. Uh, this is uh, uh, where, it's not where the U.S. presidential election will be decided. Maryland uh, is solidly blue. But uh, a little sliver of uh, the fate of the next U.S. Congress will be decided here. There's a close senator's race in Maryland. And this is in the 6th Congressional District. The outgoing uh, congressman, a Democrat, is not standing for re-election. Uh, the Republicans have a better than even chance of uh, switching that seat. And uh, when you speak to Damascenes, uh, they are gun-shy, in some instances, when it comes to talking about uh, politics. Uh, others are, are, have definitely noted the tense atmosphere. People are worried. One way or another, whatever happens, half the people aren't going to be happy, you know? The old school Democratic Republican parties, they differed on policies, but they were able to talk to each other and compromise, and now they just view each other as the enemy, which is crazy. I think it's probably 50 50 in Damascus, if I had a guess right now, for Trump. Are you worried about some of the violent rhetoric we've heard? No, I mean, we've been through it before. Uh, a, lot, a lot of it's talk, but you know, it is what it is. If they want to get upset about it, they can. The woman you heard there, she voted early. That man uh, who's uh, said he was voting for Donald Trump uh, is voting on Election Day Tuesday. Uh, note that, uh, as I said, tight congressional race. When we asked, though, uh, if it's about the candidates for that race, people said no. The top of the ticket, Charlie, is sucking the energy. That's what it's all about. Isn't that always how it is, Francois? Now, one more question for you, because we spoke to Ketaban Gorgistani uh, in Georgia. She's covering that swing state for us. And she was saying how there are a lot of preparations being made at uh, voting centers, uh, around the ballot counting as well, to keep people safe, that there have been threats. Uh, what are you hearing about around Washington, D.C.? Uh, are is, are there preparations being made around Washington, D.C. as well in case there is violence? 
Well, it's it, no one's expecting any major violence in this in, in this part. Uh, Virginia and Maryland, which are the two states that surround Washington, are expected to vote uh, blue. They're, we're not expecting any uh, particular acts of violence here in Maryland. Early voting is now closed. Uh, we'll get the results quite swiftly. Really, the eyes are on the rest of the country. And yeah, this district touches West Virginia. I said. But it also touches Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania came up in conversation. People definitely worried about what's going on one congressional, congressional district away from here. Francois Picard, we'll be talking to you uh, a lot in the next few days, and you will be hosting a special version of the debate, episode of the debate tomorrow and Wednesday uh, from live from D.C. Looking forward to it. And bringing it back to the studio here, I want to, I've been hearing so much recently about these so-called like secret Harris voters. Um, I mean, a lot of this is anecdotal, but things you see online, but I feel like it can't completely be ignored. Women specifically who maybe live with or are married to a Trump supporter who are saying that they're going to vote for Trump and then are secretly going to vote for Harris. I mean, do we know if this is an actual phenomenon? And we saw this poll come out of Iowa that would point to reproductive rights potentially being a major disruptor uh, in, this, in this election. Yes, yeah, so I think that I can't really speak exactly about whether there really are secret Kamala Harris voters that are lying in polls and that actually are going to come out. I guess we'll see that on election day. But the best that I can say is that I absolutely do think you're going to see a demographic of voters that maybe voted Trump in previous elections, or maybe were undecided or independent in previous elections, or maybe they just didn't come out to vote at all. And I do think that issues like abortion are going to be a major influence on the results of this election. I think what you saw was an incredible kind of outrage at the response of the abortion decision in America. And I think that is going to be pretty decisive. We are seeing a huge gender gap, though, when it comes to voting. In fact, I think gender is the number one or number two predictor of who you're going to vote for now. Um, for voters or for people watching you know, who aren't Americans, what are the major issues that are causing that gender gap? So I do think we touched on it. I think abortion is really one of the biggest kind of pointers of that gender gap. Specifically, you know, there's articles about mothers that are like, for the first time in a generation, my daughter has fewer rights than I have. And I think that's really powerful stuff in order to get people on the ground to volunteer, to get them actually on the ground to start helping out with campaigns. I think that is a major driver of the gender gap here. I think it's women really looking at this and being shocked at what's really happening, not only at a federal level, but also in different state um, electorates to see exactly how their rights are being minimized. And so I think that that is one of the biggest drivers here. Olivia, do you have insights into the gender gap when it comes to this election and the fact that there are 10 states, I believe, with abortion rights on the ballot? Do we expect that to, to potentially have some big sway? Yeah, definitely in bringing people to the uh, to the ballot box, especially in convincing them that it's worth voting, perhaps this time more than uh, previously. Uh, the gender gap has existed in U.S. Uh, history since at least the 1980s, 1990s. Um, so it's not new. The extent of that gap, though, is is uh, getting larger uh, to the point that perhaps we'll see um, tomorrow a 20 point gap probably between uh, the two genders. Um, I would also say that it's not just the issues, it's also the, the fact that Trump has uh, played on that gap, decided to more or less uh, seemingly at least uh, abandon uh, reaching out to women and concentrate on his sort of core uh, demographic, which is mostly men, not just white men, as you said, but also men from uh, other uh, from racial minorities, for instance, for instance, by appearing on uh, podcasts that appealed specifically to men, by having uh, pro wrestlers appear at the uh, Republican National Convention, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems pretty clear that that's the choice that he's made to sort of exploit the gap and widen it as opposed to try to bridge it. But Paul, before we go into the Trump's outreach to uh, black and Latino men, I want to get your feedback on, um, I doubt that you would say that Trump has abandoned uh, the female vote, but I mean, is it worrisome to you this, that this gender divide seems so vast? Well, the issue of uh, abortion uh, rights is a, a 
definitely in the favor of the Democrat par Party right now because there are a number of states who, it depends on the state and a number of states who've restricted it considerably. In, um, uh, but that it wasn't a um, uh, banning of abortion nationwide. It was the, the decision from the Supreme Court was to let the states decide, which is a sort of democracy, you know, um, signs of a democracy. And the referendums that are on 12 of the ballots, that's good. Let the people decide what the limits uh, of uh, abortion are. Are they six weeks? Are they uh, 36 weeks? Are they well, 12 the, uh, weeks, somewhere in between? In that vein, we saw Iowa, for example, just recently this summer put in place a very strict uh, abortion regulation, yeah. six weeks. Yeah. And we've had a, a poll just came out this weekend showing that Harris has made massive gains there yeah. with well, women with a certain and segment. older women. Yeah. Uh, and the, the thought is that that's a big contributor to it. Well, like, are, what did you think about that? The, that well, it, it's always a threat. It definitely is a threat. It was a threat in the midterms, and the Democrats did better in the midterms than we expected. Um, but Trump is not abandoning women, okay? There's, the rights of women aren't just, don't just include abortion rights. They include security rights as well. And a lot of women feel unsafe in the United States today. There's rising crime in major cities. There is massive illegal immigration. Uh, 11 million have come in under the Biden-Harris uh, four years, so the highest record in U.S. history. And they're bringing in, and there's child trafficking going on, you know. Well, every, I mean, so there's all these things happening. Men, women, these every women, demographic puts, puts the yeah, economy but and the immigration security, the top issue. The security of women is a, is a very important thing. Only, only Donald Trump talks about that. You know, the Democrat Party ignores the rising crime. They ignore the massive uh, Im illegal, not legal, illegal immigration that's coming in with drugs, fentanyl, with uh, well, child I trafficking, like all Harris these things. I feel like made, uh, they don't, her, use, tried to leverage her prosecutor passed uh, as a way yeah, to... Yeah, she talks about so her history I would, in, I would in actually, California, but there's not much there. I would pretty much tacitly agree to a lot of what he's saying. I think when what Paul's getting at here when he says Trump talks about this, but the Democrats don't really talk about it, is I think Democrats have been working on enacting policy to reform a lot of these issues. Whereas I think if you look at Trump's record back in 2016 to 2020, when you look at what he actually did, he didn't accomplish anything he set out to accomplish. And even looking aside of whether we think that that would actually be substantial to resolving some of the problems that were just mentioned right now, Democrats actually sought out to resolve these issues that were being discussed. I think Trump goes around campaigning and he talks enormous talks about how there are apparently millions of illegal migrants that are coming in and bringing in all these child traffickers that are doing horrible things. And I think if you actually look at who's implementing reforms that are genuinely trying to change things, he talks a big talk. He's not doing any actual policy work. I mean, the well, if, could I respond yes, to that? Okay. Do. I mean, anybody who's follows what's, followed what's been happening in the past four years would find that, I'm sorry, with respect, quite absurd. Donald Trump was four years. He has a record of four years between 16 and 20. He closed the border. He reduced crime. He reduced inflation. He, he, he reduced wars going on throughout so, the world. And in I the past say four Trump years, Trump is not somebody who speaks. going on around the world. I think that is... I'm sorry? A, I, I wouldn't say Trump reduced the number of wars He didn't going start on. any new ones. And I would say Biden was not out here starting any new ones. But also, Kamala Harris is not he was President Biden. Okay, These well, if you, if you exclude Ukraine and the war in the Middle East, uh, I guess nothing is new. But actually, the world is getting very, very dangerous. The wars in the Middle East and Ukraine are escalating at a rate that yeah, could be extremely I talk dangerous. About Ukraine and Gaza. I want to make sure that we get time to talk about that. I want to ask you, Paul, though, about what we've touched on with, uh, sorry, with, um, uh, with black and Latino men and Trump's outreach to black and Latino well, men. Well, you know, the Republican Party has become the big tent, unlike the images that and and, and the people think see in Europe. Um, we don't typically look at race and 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 sex and all of that. It's 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 trying to bring everyone up, and in, 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 Trump showed in four years. I mean, he's already done it. Kamala had a chance to do it, Joe Biden did not do it, did not improve the U.S. society. People are still really hurting, and now she's talking about how now she's going to change it. Trump's already done it, okay? He's the man of action, she's the, the woman of words, and usually just 
difficult to understand words. Um, so yeah, he's done a lot. Uh, and to the Ameri to the Latinos, your question on Latinos, he. He did a lot for blacks and Latinos in 2016 to 2020, and they know that he's going to do more because he's addressing their issues. Um, you know, people are hurting with the cost of goods going up, the cost of energy still up. Um, you know, people are worried about crime. People are, 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 are worried about our education system, uh, the illegal immigration. There are 11 million who have come in. Everyone knows that. Um, and, and people are concerned. And so no matter what your race is, uh, what your sex is, a uh, lot of people are voting for Donald Trump. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very diverse group of people. And it's quite uh, promising. Yeah. Olivia, something Paul just said sparked something in my brain. That both, it's very unique how both candidates are trying to be the change candidate mm. in this election, even though both are also very well-known entities. Uh, I, how are both of them trying to frame themselves? They have extremely high name recognition as the new future for America. Harris is saying we're not going back, meaning we're not going back to the Trump era of division, of uh, anxieties, of sort of Twitter rants by Trump, uh, of chaos in the White House. She's arguing that we're going to a, a future where things are going to be more stable and we, you're not going to be worried about what's going on in Washington. Uh, that's her argument. Uh, Trump is making a different argument in terms of change. He's saying, um, look at what Biden brought you in terms of inflation, in terms of wars, for instance. Now, of course, we can disagree as to whether Biden is actually the source of inflation of, or the wars in Ukraine or, uh, or the Middle East. But that's the argument that he's making to voters. And Trump is saying that with me, you'd be going back to a pre-2020 United States where the economy was growing. You didn't have COVID. Um, things were, were more stable. There was no inflation uh, and so on and so forth. That's the argument that he's making, at least. Because the big well, question again, you have 70% of Americans who believe that America is on the wrong track today, right? You've heard that number. That uh, and yet, kind of still number depends on what polls you're looking at. Uh, across many polls, it's at least the vast majority. Uh, and yet, you still have 50% of, of America voting for Harris, who is really Biden 2.0. I mean, she talks about change, but when she's asked, what would you have done differently? Uh, during the Biden administration, and she says, nothing. I wouldn't have done anything different. Well, people are hurting. Real people are hurting uh, economically, security-wise. There's a, there's a war on free speech by the Democrats against the Republicans, and everybody knows this. But let's not forget why Elon Musk bought t Twitter, because all the social medias work directly with the Biden administration to censor opposing views, like Republicans. That's not a democracy. And Harris has said already she's going to start cracking down even more on social media. You know, they, they wanted to create a ministry of truth. Do you remember that? The minister of I don't information? Know, I, I don't know if, uh, yeah, <laughs> if our global audience is going to really understand. I want to kind of stay more, more high I level. I think all of here. this is really just turning into further misinformation, if we're being honest here. If we're looking at the kind of social media like posts that were censored, censored, that we're talking about, it's social media posts that factually were inaccurate. You had social media posts that were advocating for just a completely different series of events that were arguing for things that had just never happened. So when you come, when we see, you know, Republicans come out talking about how, you know, there is this effort of censorship that is trying to, f like, advocate against freedom of speech, what Democrats are really fighting for is to just see the truth being said. They just want news corporations to be talking about the truth, and they also want truth to be the widespread conversation of America. And so really, these are just efforts taken on social media to ensure that. So you agree with I want, I was, uh, censoring I'm sorry to cut you guys off. We've got five minutes media. left, though. I want to make I sure we get to the kind of the big question. The I would not big question that I've been, I would say you're putting words in my mouth. <laughs> well, you know, I want to make sure we get you, to the big question that I feel like everyone in my life has been texting me, which is, when are we going to know the results mm. uh, is it do we, Olivia what do we know as far as whether it's likely to be longer or shorter than in 2020 where we didn't have the results until the Saturday after the vote um, it's 
I would say probably uh, we'll have to wait until the end of the week. There are some states that have decided not to count, start counting uh, early ballots until uh, the actual election day. So that's going to slow down the process. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on the margins as well. If the margins are closed, then uh, we will have to wait much longer. But I'd say probably in the end, the end of the week. Okay. Paul, are you concerned at all about potentially Trump not conceding or about... No, no. I mean, I'm, it's going to be a close race. I've always said that. You know, it's going to come down to the swing states, and, and we'll see. I mean, let's not forget that 2020, um, Biden only won by 44,000 votes in, those, in three of those swing states. So it was an extremely close race. Um, and it's going to be similar. Um, a lot of Republicans think he's going to win by a, grunt, a, a large margin. I would, I would, I would hope so. But it's going to come down to uh, it's going to be very close. And then both sides, either Republicans or, or uh, uh, Democrats, whoever loses is going to make some challenges to the results, and that's going to take some time. As, and both sides have the right to do that. You know. Um, Donald Trump is not the only one who challenged the, uh, the results of an election in 2020. But you're not worried about another, like, January 6th No, I'm not worried about a January 6th or, or any or violence like that. No. I think that um, uh, it'll be, it, it could take a while, uh, as Olivier said. It, it, I think it's going to be not as long as people think because of all the early voting and all of that. And they put some good measures in place for better integrity. But, you know, integrity measures should be embraced. We should not be embracing the Democrat uh, agenda, which is to make voting as easy as possible. You see, voting should be, in, it should be uh, done fair and just and integrity measures like you have in France with voter ID and voting in place on the same day. We don't have that in the United States, in most of the states. And Sorry, so that's why it gets chaotic. There voter IDs in the United States? We don't have photo ID in many states. You have forms of ID, like it could be a bill, it could be a social security number, but it's not a photo ID everywhere, no. Oh, but, I mean, but there is some form of ID. There's some ID. form of ID, yes, so in some in states. So in all 50 states, there are, there is voter ID. Yeah, well, if you consider an electric bill or something of uh, an ID. In what state you know, you is have an to, electric you, bill? No, but I mean. It, it does vary. This is what makes not, it they're so very, bad. There's very 50 limited, different systems. Very Sorry, the point, that I'm, systems. The point that I'm trying to get at here is, I think when we talk about Democrats trying to make voting as easy as possible, I think voting, you know, with measures to make sure that voting is secure and mm -hmm. to make sure that there are actual citizens voting, Democrats are just trying to make sure that this is a seamless process. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's all Democrats are trying to do. And what we're seeing Republicans try to do is make it as difficult as humanly possible for people in Democratic cities and for people in large Democratic, like, populated, populated areas to actually come out and vote. Well, and I think that's the difference say. between that's the That's what they always say. It's <laughs> voter suppression, but it's not voter suppression. We saw thousands and thousands of examples of voter fraud after 2020. But the media was silent about it. Mm. In last, in, I mean, this in, has been widely, no. this has been just, no, 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 just no, no, proven no, no, no. that there it was any not. fraud it that could not. have actually it changed not. The, the election. But yeah, but there we have, is we have just 30 fraud. seconds left. Exist. I want to get a and last vibe check. Minimize it. I want to get a last vibe check from, from everyone. How, how confident are you that your candidates are going to win? We're feeling pretty good. We're feeling pretty great. We have a great ground game. We have had a fantastic fundraising strategy. We've had a lot of enthusiasm for Kamala Harris. We're feeling good about the results. Well, I guess we're both feeling good. That's good. You know, <laughs> both, uh, both the campaigns are projecting confidence. Yeah, well, yeah, so. Everybody wants to feel positive about their candidate. Um, but the reality is the joy is really gone from the uh, Harris campaign. They're starting to panic. They see that they could lose quite quick, quite easily if they lose some of the major swing states, and already they're starting to uh, point the finger at each other and, and putting I the think blame all of game. I rhetoric and maybe, about panic is totally, it's well, coming we'll out see, of we'll We're see. not I seeing mean, it. You know, I'm, well, not, well, I'm not a future teller, the, the big, but we'll see. The big takeaway from all of the coverage I've seen is that we cannot, unfortunately, have a crystal ball. We have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. I'm dying with suspense. I'm sure everyone <laughs> watching it all missed you. Yeah, I want to thank all three of you uh, for being a part of this uh, pre uh, this election eve debate. Uh, Paul Rehn, president of Republicans in France, Donna Gauche, delegate for Democrats abroad, and Olivier Bertin, U.S. historian. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much.